everyone. Welcome to Meta Interview with Clara Kopi. Today I'm here with Woodward. He's a co-founder of New Publisher and a writer on the New Community and also Metaverse Style's Bard. <laughs> How are you, Woodward? Uh, I'm well enough. How are you? I'm well enough, too. <laughs> One of those days. We all have those, I guess. Yeah, it's part of life. But it's okay. It's nice to talk to people. Absolutely. So let's start by a little bit of your, of your background. Um, what did you do to you get to Web3? And whatever you feel people, it would be nice to people to know about you. Um, how did I get to Web3? Uh, I got to Web3, strictly speaking, from an interest I've always had for, I guess, now the better part of 10 years. Uh, I'd always been interested in crypto and blockchain as a technology and a software solution. Um, and, but I never really found that I could have a place in it, or I believed as such that is. Uh, and it wasn't until I spent some time uh, within my mid-20s uh, doing more research that I came into contact with someone who was, in, was more enmeshed in Web3 and in crypto than I was at the time. And I asked them if they knew anything about it, and they immediately sent me a few links with instructions about how to create a MetaMask wallet. So I did that uh, in the middle of nowhere, which is where I was at the time. Mm -hmm. And once I performed all those instructions, I told this person that I'd done so. And they deposited six Ethereum tokens into my wallet when Ethereum was worth about $138 at the time. All of these things were unexpected, uh, but I kept reading and I forgot about it because I didn't know exactly what I could do with those tokens. I just knew they had value. And it wasn't until three or four years later that I was minding my own business in a city instead of in the middle of nowhere. And someone that I was in a car with mentioned that Ethereum was up to $1,118. And that's immediately caught my attention because I asked again and then I went on my phone and I looked it up and it turns out that it had appreciated in value almost $1,000. Yeah. <laughs> And that blew me away and that bailed me out of a big problem. Thank you again for that. And um, again, I saw no value in itself. I just knew that those coins had value and I started to get involved in the market. And it wasn't until a bit later than that, that this same contact asked me if I'd ever heard of near protocol. I said, no. And much like the same time initially, she sent me instruction. And I followed those instructions and I created my near wallet, which was significantly easier this time. Yeah. And um, again, she, I bought six tokens just because six seemed to be a magic number at that <coughs> point. And I forgot about it because I didn't know what else to do with it. And within a few months, she asked me if I wanted to get involved. And I said, no. <laughs> because I didn't know what I could do. I didn't know what talents I could offer. So just based on that doubt and that skepticism, I sort of ignored it until about last November in which I was messaged by that same person. And she said, I'll make you a deal if you do what I ask for six months and you get involved in this ecosystem and you don't like it, I'll never ask you about it again. And that was November and I've been in near ever since. And that's how I got here. That's great. Um, yeah, like, wow, six Ethereum, <laughs> it, it makes a change in a, in, in, in a few person's life when, yeah. Woo. Yeah, I, I was in, I was in quite a bit of trouble at that time and I didn't know how I was going to get out of it until someone mentioned that. <laughs> oh, and that's, wow, lifesaver. Yeah. You had, you had a, a piggy bank. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something along those lines. And you didn't know. <laughs> I had absolutely no idea. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's a good thing in crypto. Um, at the same time, there's a big risk. There's also a big possibility that it turns out that, wow, I hope one day near is like, ooh, a hundred, a thousand. <laughs> Who knows? 
But it, yes, I, yeah, I, I saw it firsthand that I, I didn't expect anything to happen with it until I slept for four years and then it went yeah. up a thousand dollars. You ended up being a holder uh, without any intention of being. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's cool. It's amazing. It is. And how is for you to uh, this transition from uh, what did, with what did you work before? And how was your transition to starting working in Web3 and blockchain? Hmm. Well, um, more often than not, I, I usually tell people that my first job was when I was around 10 years old because uh, my mother had her own catering company and it was sort of a family business. So everyone sort of had their own task here and there. So I started then. And little by little, I was given things to learn just because it was valuable. I was taught how to use a keyboard, how to use Microsoft Office, um, emailing early, um, spreadsheets, payroll, and a lot of basic office administration stuff that I n almost never used, <laughs> ever. Because after I got out of high school and then into college, uh, most of my work during my college and my post high school years was spent bartending for that same company. She would stage weddings and I would bartend the weddings themselves and work within the wedding and all of that stuff. And in between those things, I would always seem to be uh, stuck in uh, jobs with some kind of manual labor working with my hands, warehouses, things of the like. Mm -hmm. uh, so even though I had a bachelor's degree, I never really did anything with it uh, until I guess here, although I don't consider it because my degree is in technical management and I'm not really doing any kind of technical management in my degree, in my opinion, I'm just writing. That's why I call myself a writer. <laughs> um, but before all those things, I just mostly worked with my hands or worked in almost anything that is not web3 or writing related writing was the last thing i had on my mind to be honest uh but it, it sort of became one of those things where i realized that everyone else kept asking me if i was a writer over and over again until it got to a point where I stopped saying no or I guess or maybe or not exactly to, yes, I guess so. Hi, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As an artist, I had the same uh, curve. Like, well, when I was younger, when someone said that I was an artist or something, I didn't accept. I said, oh, I sing. I'm not a singer. Or, oh, I paint. I'm not a painter. I just used to say it to be like this because I wasn't very secure. I, I thought I didn't know enough, but what is enough? Like, when would it be enough? Oh, it, it was never perfect. Mm -mm. And the problem is that it always seems that a person, or at least in my opinion, I never considered myself a writer because I know what a writer is. Much like I stopped playing guitar in my teenage years until I was 22 and I stopped caring what anyone thought because I knew what a guitar sounded like <laughs> and because I couldn't sound like that I got so annoyed that I stopped I was like clearly this isn't for me and I put it away and then writing was very much the same I knew what writing was but everyone thought it was good but in my mind I was like this Stephen King's a writer H.P. Lovecraft's a writer Le uh, Leo Tolstoy is a writer. Alexander Dumas is a, is a writer. This is not writing. So I grabbed it and I put it all in a folder and I threw it in a corner of my room and I forgot about it. It's it's the overcritical nature, I guess, of a creative person. Yeah. Uh, many of us have it, have it. Some don't and they do well, even though many, many people that I see that think they are awesome are not. <laughs> But good for them, I wish. <laughs> I imagine that even if that were true, it certainly must feel better to feel certain of your abilities. Yeah, I, I actually would like to have all this, this 
feel this confidence safe, yeah this confidence feel feel safe in that way like oh yeah i'm doing a great job all the time like i, I know i i i make an effort to do my best but yeah we, we keep uh judging ourselves sometimes too much about uh what we think it's the right way to be because we saw someone that we think was awesome and we think we have to be like that yeah usually i don't consider that i succeeded at doing anything unless everyone 100 of everyone including me thinks it looks good or it is good yeah, then it you. is I guess but you. if only one <laughs> if one person disagrees then it's then it's not good enough yeah artists or creatives <laughs> We have this, this thing. Well, society, uh, most of the times, uh, don't help. Doesn't help a lot. Like, like a lot of judgments and uh, devaluing what creative people do, even though they don't live without it. Like, but yeah, we we see it here in Brazil. There's a lot of that. Uh, artists are very ap um, appreciated, unappreciated. Unappreciated, yes. Unappreciated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's uh, the not many polit for. Oh. <laughs> there isn't a lot of support to to the creative people from Brazil. But yeah, we resist, we endure. One day we'll get better, hopefully. And now we have we we don't rely on the government or only, like we have. Uh, a great initiative like Creative Style, for instance, to allow us to have other possibilities to create and get paid for it because we all have bills to pay. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Now that I think about it, th that was the first time I ever wrote for something and got paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> but then that's good. Like, you, you can create. Yeah, it's a good feeling. Yeah, because you feel valued. Like you, yeah. you do your work and you get paid, and and it's not badly paid. Like oh, I will just um, dis disclose your work. Like I'll show it to people. That's payment. Can I pay with that? <laughs> Can I go to the bakery and say, oh, I'll tell people your bread is very good. <laughs> my my stomach doesn't get satisfied off of a participation certificate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly, like I I can pay the guy in the in the supermarket with, I'll tell people that your supermarket is extra nice. <laughs> yeah, uh, the the way that I'd worry is that, in, in in a world because I won't just say a country because my country is no different, but in a world where currency is based on valuation of life, and that's indisputable because everyone who needs to eat has to pay for it with some kind of consideration we yeah. can't contest that we can't debate it um in a world where that continues to be true our labor or our creativity or our creations will always be diminished if they do not produce some kind of valuation that valuation is validation so even though i may not like what i write or i might not think that what i wrote was the best that wrote that writing got paid for And that payment is validation of that work. Yeah. So even if it might not have been my best work, ironically enough, even though I'm aware of it, I'm the proudest of it because it was the most validated. Yeah. And because it. it it fed me. Yeah. None of my other writing fed me before. Exactly. And, and that makes us feel good because uh, there's this human factor in it because we, we need to to feel valued and have some safety and uh, eat and live somewhere <laughs> so it's good to be able to provide for ourselves with our creative work and that's yeah something it, it adds intrinsic respect to the work itself yeah that's something very amazing about the the possibilities in the queer community uh, it's empowering to, yeah empowering that's a good word And uh, 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 tell us a bit about the DAOs you're involved. You, you are a Mia publisher and mm. you are also a member of Metaverse DAO now? Yes. Um, about This is actually my first week. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I am involved in two DAOs, personally speaking. Um, one is NXP, Nerex Publish, and the second one is Metaverse DAO. Uh, since everyone seems to already have an idea what Metaverse DAO is because of the channel itself, I'll go into NXP. And NXP is actually pretty straightforward. We're a publishing guild, or at least that's what it was pitched as when it was asked for me to join. See, I was actually pretty fresh in Nier at the time. And when I was being shown around, so to speak, one of the first questions that I was asked within day three or four was, how much do you know about DAOs? And I said very little to nothing at all. And then they told me about it. And what surprised me the most about DAO systems was that it seemed to me to be the embodiment of everything that I thought that blockchain was meant to solve. The egalitarianism of it, um, the immutability and the accountability of it, in so much as that it precludes the possibility of corruption as long as the software is solid. One of uh, the projects that I'm involved in in near right now, um, OFP, they have a member in it who once said, the reason that I like blockchain and near protocol by proxy is because it makes the argument that you don't have to trust us. You have to trust the software. As long as you trust the software and the software is good, you don't need to trust us because we're trusting the software too. None of us are doing this. The We're trusting all of that on the blockchain. So to me, that seemed like a really brilliant and novel way to remove the idea of corruption or selfishness or centralization by removing it from the hands of anybody who could be incentivized or corrupted. And the only person that can do that is someone that's impartial and has nothing to gain, and that's the software. So when I was introduced to this concept and all of that started to click in, within two days of me learning about that, that same person approached me and asked me if I wanted to join one. And I said, no. <laughs> No way. I don't, don't want to do that. I just got here. I don't know anything. I'm not just going to jump into a DAO and pretend to have the right to make decisions over other people when I'm too new. I don't have that right. I don't have the wisdom. Uh, I don't even know how to work the operating system and the user interface. I'm not doing it. No. And then they said, well, the reason I'm asking is because you need four people to make one. And these people only have three. And I said, Oh, well, in that case, then yes, because I wasn't going to not let them have one. So my plan initially was that I'd let them do it and then I'd just be a member and hang out there and let them do the, the decision making stuff because, again, I didn't feel I had the right to chime in. And then over time, I just started writing things for them to journal the things I witnessed or that I'd experienced or just to give them clout or attention. And before I knew it, there was a bounty for writing campfire stories. And I asked how graphic or horrifying or unsettling the story could be. And they said, it doesn't matter. And I said, are you sure it doesn't matter? Because I'm going to make it very, very, very unsettling. And they said it still doesn't matter. So I spent about two hours writing it on my phone and I submitted it and then I forgot. And my publishing guild just kept carrying on. And then two weeks later, it turns out I won. And then I started writing for you guys after that and narrating the stories, not just my own, for you guys. And then I was asked to join Metaverse DAO. And that's where I am now. As far as what NXP itself does, it's a publishing and creative collaboration think tank almost. One of us is really good with audio. One of us is really good with drawing, which is great because I'm a horrible artist. <laughs> and I do the writing. And one of us, who I think is kind of the mascot and the soul of the DAO, is in the West Coast and they have a print shop. And they can print just about anything onto any surface you can and can't imagine. <laughs> they printed some of my near knots onto posters in order to advertise our guild. And yeah, they posted, cool. they printed some of those near knots onto glasses, like glass mugs. You said near knots? Mm hmm. The monkeys with the space suit on. It's a giant oh, NFT. Oh, yeah, near knots. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. We made them into posters, into ashtrays, into coffee mugs. We put them everywhere. That's cool. But yeah, that print shop is basically the soul of what we do, and everyone else just sort of try do whatever you can to promote it. That's great. And I know. Where where is the the publisher? Uh, the print shop itself is in California, but we consider our headquarters to be America proper. What? Sorry. We consider our headquarters to be all of America because oh, okay. I am in the, I am on the West Coast in Miami. Our artist is all the way down south in Texas. Our music expert, she lives up north in Chicago, Illinois, and our print shop is all the way in the West in California. So we're everywhere. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and what the inspiration to and the motivation to become a writer on this Web three world and of to become uh, oh, how would you say yeah to to get involved to like what do you think motivates you to to do that you think it was the opportunity or you think it's more than that I think it was a desire to give myself and offer myself because when you have a mentality that you don't have anything to offer you offer whatever it is you think you can and um in my mind because i kept thinking well i'm not a developer i'm not a software engineer i'm not venture capital so i kept thinking what do i have and what could i do i'm not just going to sit here and accumulate tokens and tell people that I exist. I had to do something with myself. And the only thing that I thought I could do was write. So at first I would write as a journaling device, the things I'd experienced the first time I played with ref finance or the first time I'd been exposed to Metapool or my first meeting with my mentor, Cronier, and for, who is now in the Near Foundation. Nice. Um, or about my the first time I joined and why I joined. I actually said that story before. Um, thank you, Grace, for bringing me, by the way. Um, it's It just became a way of me proving that I exist while at the same time sharing my experiences because I didn't think that I had anything else to give. And then over time, that same mentality of me finding a way to place myself in places. For example, I didn't think that the bounty would work and yet it did. And I won. I didn't want to do the hosting because I didn't think it would work, but I did. Um, and every time I did one of those things, I asked for permission for me to write about it. And eventually I'd write ab for, about that and tag the person involved if possible. And, Before I knew it, I was writing and editing things for people as a favor. I'm, I just did that five minutes ago. I edited someone's proposal because they asked me to. And so if, why did I write? Because I didn't know what else to do. I'm, I don't know IT well enough for me to code it. I don't know writing or art enough for me to make NFTs. I don't have enough cash for me to invest in anyone. But I write because I like to read and I like comic books and manga and anime and nerd culture. So I can turn a phrase every once in a while. And I'm clever with the way I say things sometimes. And at first I thought it didn't have value until it started having value. Yeah. because that's it. Uh, uh, we saw that you were good in what you were doing and you were there interacting and doing it very, very very well and the audio you sent showed us that you were good telling stories so <laughs> you you you, <laughs> you showed that you were good because you you created uh, something that n no one did so uh, even though you, you weren't trying to to win like you said or something that you, you didn't think it would happen even though you the, you, you tried You tried, you did something different and you showed. Uh, and this is something that happens a lot in here. Uh, even if you don't have a degree on something or if you don't have a course, but you went there and, and you do it and it's good. 
you get it. Because you show that you can do it. That narrating thing actually wasn't intentional. The reason I had that audio file was because I wanted to share the a piece of the story with my own publishing guild. But I know that they probably wouldn't have the time to read that whole thing. So I put it into audio format and I threw it at them and, and asked what they thought. So when the time came for me to read the story, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to read the story. So I was going to ask if my if I could send them the audio version of what I read and if that would be good enough. I, it wasn't really with me intending to you know, send a narration of what I could do. It was more circumstantial. I never planned that way. And it, it was it was it was more interesting that it worked out than for it to seem like it was intentional. I wish it was intentional. That would have been so awesome. <laughs> and then and then it just so happened that when I gave it to my guild, they added audio tracking to it. So it became sort of like a creepy pasta, which I actually really like. I haven't done those since, but um, the person who created that audio is interested in me doing it again. I might actually try to submit a couple of those on YouTube and see how they do. Cool. That's great. Yeah, because it was very good. So it would be nice to to, to check it out. Because, yeah, people uh, seem to be, especially when it's on the, on the screen, like a cell phone on a computer, our attention span is very <laughs> limited because me, for instance, I have what, like a 30 tabs open. So sometimes when I need to focus, I have to open other, other, another window and put just what I have to focus on that <laughs> so I can focus because it's too much. There's a lot of things happen, uh, happening all the time and we have to think of a thousand things we have to do. So uh, sometimes uh, being able to hear the story is is easier than to to focus on reading. Actually, that occurred to me also because I never like to hear my stories. I always like to read because I thought that audio books of any kind were cheating. <laughs> so I didn't want to cheat. So I was like, no, I, I'd rather read the book. And then it got to a point where most of the things that I had to do with school and work, they involved my hands and my eyes. I, that's where my attention on both of those things have to be, which is ironically enough what I need for my books. So it got to a point where I had to decide what did it mean more to me to not read those books or would I overlook those principles? So the first time I did it, it, I didn't realize I finished that book until I was done with my work day and I was going home and the book was done and it felt like nothing because it made the day go by easier. And it, I'd been reading audiobooks ever since I've, I don't think I've read a single book on print if I can help it since, <laughs> because I know how to read. I just need the information in the book. That's true. Uh, I, I, I was tra talking to you the other day that I have to try it because I never, I never heard an audiobook. I don't know why, it just didn't yeah. happen. And I, I have a Kindle and I use it. it it's been what more than five years now. It's, it helps a lot, but yeah, sometimes I don't have time to stop and or I don't organize myself in a way that puts time to read and listening will be easier when I'm doing something mechanical for instance a lot uh very much so my phone has a memory card in it that's about 120 gigs 40 of those are books and 10 gigs of those are in print and the rest are in audio yeah I can't because it's just, it's just easier yeah, and reading on the on the on the cell phone, I think it tires my eyes so much. So that's why I got a Kindle a few years ago. Because uh, in college, we had a bunch of books and cop copies that we had to make from material, and much of the material we, we, I could find online. So well, I read English, so for me it was even easier to 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 find material because 
there's more of that available so yeah i i got a kindle and that was a life changer actually i saved money getting a kindle <laughs> yeah probably print is expensive yeah and space because sometimes you get those books um for college that are like this and you will, and they will make you read a chapter <laughs> yeah or two and I, oh come on really you think you what we're made of money <laughs> <sighs> and, i don't want to get into that topic yeah because i wasn't i was in literature school so yeah uh, oh yeah <laughs> lots of books <laughs> lots of it oh but i gave up it's terrible they so don't give you the pressure. books you like. Sorry? They don't give you the books you like. Oh, yeah. It's so much ugh, frustrating. Uh, no creativity at all. So I, I, I just ugh, get sick of it and dropped. <laughs> I don't blame you. Yeah, I went to four different schools before I got graduated. <laughs> wow. I graduated in arts. <laughs> but yeah crazy and i only i only succeeded because it was contemporary art so i could do anything i wanted <laughs> yeah as long as it's modern <laughs> yeah <laughs> and I, could, I could do anything uh, anything just go there do express stuff. yourself yeah and explain it but you have to explain you have to yeah have a good excuse for the craziness you're doing <laughs> Well, it should have a reason. Otherwise, it is just nonsense. Yeah, to, uh, like uh, I just said something Portuguese. <laughs> like you, you throw stuff on paper. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, uh, I could. I knew how to explain it. But that's good. So you you already touched the subject of why you did you choose to come and play in your protocol, and but do you have anything? other to to add to that uh, um if you don't it's okay <laughs> it, it's not so much that i don't it's that the main reason that i came to play in your protocol is because i guess it's better than where i was before otherwise i'd probably still be there the reason that i say that is because I did all the things that I've done in my past for the most part to survive, but I never really felt like I felt like I fit in anywhere. Um, I'm in this interview looking how I look by choice. I wrote what I wrote by choice. The themes that I touched were by choice. The way that I narrated that story is by choice. The freedom to be who I am, how I am, and not be worried about the overt judgment as to what that might entail is liberating. And by that, I mean, I'm a generally unconventional person. Anybody who's read that story knows it's unconventional. It's a horror story, but at the same time, it's a horror story about suicide. And the ending of that story is suicide is only a bad idea because what's after is worse yeah. <laughs> and that's the last kind forever. Of, <laughs> yeah that's not the horror story like there's this big bad monster that came out of the darkness and it's gonna kill you if you don't either fight it or run away from it it's not it's not conventional horror and i guess that's the best way to put it even in weird circles of the world I don't fit in there either I was the kid who liked horror stories ever since I was little I liked video games I liked comic books when it was not cool it's cool to like those things now it wasn't cool when I was a kid that's different <laughs> um, but You're about the same age it wasn't cool and well I'm telling the that. world because the world doesn't know that there was a time before when it wasn't cool to like Star Wars it was a dark yeah. time um <laughs> But it was never cool or acceptable to be me. And as I got older, that didn't really change that much. It just went from being school to being work to being society. And it got to a point where I was in my mid-20s where I was okay with it, that I would just survive and carry on and 
be wherever I be and survive however I'd survive, and that's fine. It, it's been I've seen worse. There are a lot of place a lot of places worse to live than in Miami, just <laughs> scraping by to survive. Um, but it's not a way to be happy, yeah. or it's not a way to find peace. And the reason I'm here is because I have those things. I have the peace and the liberty to demonstrate who I am, even though I didn't want to show my face. Um, my work, my writing, all of it is a reflection and a manifestation of almost entirely what's in here. Very rarely have I filtered my stories. Very rarely have I filtered my articles. Very rarely have I filtered the person I present. It might be a more professional version of the person that I am, but it's still me in a way that I've never been in almost any other professional setting. I've had to fix this or fix this or not show this or not have this or not say this or not think this or... And in near for the most part, none of that stuff really exists or rather there's a much broader acceptance of what is okay and what's welcoming. Yeah. Competence seems to, seems to be prevailing here. Yes. And, and that's it because uh, we're, we're human, all of us. We are building this blockchain and we use the softwares, but we, we, we're still human. And yeah, we, we have our differences and some many of us are neurotypical. So we, we have our other way to function and adapting uh, many times is frustrating and almost suffocates many of the creative people because it's common for us to be different, to, to be and not only different but to have challenges like being neurotypical um, but yeah it's, it's completely fine because it's very common for that to happen but our society usually hides it like a big taboo we can talk about it like suicide we can talk about suicide that's who does that <laughs> well we do so why not we're, we're here talking the word I, I hope uh, YouTube doesn't censorship. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't censor. Please don't hurt us. Please don't hurt us, gods of Google. Yeah, we're not encouraging anyone. Uh, actually, on the contrary, what do we want no, is for, for more people to, because if more people can be themselves and be happy with who they are, I don't think they would feel like they have to do this. If they could be happy being who they are. I think, it it, I think that that's a very good way of putting it because it, it seems like creative people create certain things as a way of letting out what's inside. Yeah. Like some of the stuff that I've written that in my opinion was the best was me letting out something that became a manifestation of something I felt like that describes those descriptions in that particular story came from a mentality and, this, and a frame of mind that I could only channel into because of a moment that I'd experienced myself. And I, I personally believe that a person only resorts to suicide or resorts to giving up, so to speak, when those things stop helping. Or maybe when those things aren't noticed for what they are. Because a person who is making music or making art, that's two to three hours that they're not doing or thinking about something less productive or less positive. And I'd much rather have someone writing or painting or singing or playing music or whatever it is that makes them happy over thinking about what makes them sad. Yeah, it's true. Or even uh, talking about it in a healthy way and letting it out. Like, many, there are many people that sing about this this kind of stuff, but they shout and they they feel like this catharsis happening there, and then oh, they're okay. They 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 carry on with their lives. 
They talk about it because and, and it's okay to talk about it because it's healthier than uh, repressing it. That's make that makes us sick. Music like that has made me feel less alone in the past. I agree. Yeah, we have our phases. Like sometimes I want to hear the trash metal. Sometimes I want to hear to jazz. So yeah. <laughs> And sometimes I want to listen to pop music, random pop music. It happens. Um, uh, it depends on the phase, on the day, or what I'm feeling. Multifaceted? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to judge myself a lot, but now I listen to whatever I feel like. Like I used to be a headbanger. Oh, I only listen to metal. <laughs> but that's not yeah. me anymore. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, the world isn't that black and white. <laughs> yeah, no. And I, I don't fit in that uh, for, for a long time. Uh, I use, I don't dislike it, but I'm just, it's just not me anymore. Yeah. But that's it. Uh, oh, okay. Now, uh, talking about the metaverse. <laughs> what, is it, what are your thoughts on the metaverse? And how do you think that... Uh, hey, yeah. What do you think of the metaverse? And how was your experience with it? Because... Uh, my first experience with the metaverse is actually quite intimidating because my tech sucks. <laughs> uh, so my first experience was some was being asked to jump into the metaverse and to read my story. So I didn't know if I could get in. And I definitely didn't know if my hardware would not have a heart attack and catch on fire <laughs> the fact that I tried to start talking. So... Um, my first response in my head was no. Um, but like every other time I said no before, I talked myself into it somehow. And my experience with the metaverse was interesting because when I first jumped in, first of all, it's not what everyone expects. It's a bunch of different rooms all looking like it was built by a bunch of different people. And it's beautifully quaint it's not like a polished brand new ps5 uh triple a title but at the same time it's also not like pong or space invaders but it's close to space invaders in a really cool way and i jumped in and i was just a anonymous marionette floating in nowhere in a giant black forest made of what looked like puzzle pieces and the fire looked like it was a minecraft fire and i told a story there and it's not what anyone expects because especially me my idea of what the metaverse is is like ready player one and that's where we're gonna go eventually we're gonna get there but i you never in a movie or in a book or in fantasy stories ever see the beginning product which is what the metaverse and web 3 is now it's where we are to get to where we're going that's where everyone wants to be who doesn't want to be in that place but the fact that i got to see phase one of that future was mind-blowing because i never thought i'd go there because my tech sucks because i don't have anything to do there before this i really didn't like, there was nothing for me. I'm a gamer, but I'm a console gamer, and I like to play video games, but I don't like to socialize much. So my experience with the metaverse was intimidating, and everything was new, and everything was unexpected. But at the same time, it was, I don't know, I felt like I was being history. That's the simplest way to put it, I guess. All of that put into one feeling one sentence would be it felt like being history yeah like wow look at the beginning of it as this is one of the metaverses that uh, we have now like uh i don't know if you ever saw near hub mm -hmm. this newest metaverse it's more 3d like a regular uh, more um what we think of 3d usually uh, voxels yeah. is is more that metaverse that we went is more voxelized that's pix it's like a 3d pixel uh, mm. and because it is supposed to be lighter because yeah the like if you go to the central land or the sandbox wow 
it really the computer seems like it's going to blow <laughs> so oh, heavy <laughs> so heavy the computer like gets crazy like it, it starts to overheat because it's too heavy because it's 3d so and because uh, on your hub i think because it loads one room at a time it's okay uh, the computer can deal with that and the, the cell phone also some people go to on the cell phone yeah. but when you try to load a world in 3d uh we, we don't have the machine power well we don't know me <laughs> or <laughs> most of the the people from the third world <laughs> certainly not myself <laughs> yeah like the those places like i can't handle it i, I can't get on in it but i, I i'm a, I get, all the time i'm afraid i have to close everything on my computer nothing the entire open. computer has to yeah. focus on that program exactly i have to close everything and then okay i can go in the central end and check it out but wow <laughs> it's insane the 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 pc power that it, it requires but it's okay it's, it's because of that um from a few a few years in the future i think that it will be way easier and with the popularization of the virtual glasses and such i think also it will get easier because it's a device that is dedicated for this so all the, its computer power is to show you cool graphics so yeah it doesn't have to open the, your browser or your microsoft word for you to, <laughs> to well who uses that i don't know <laughs> i use google google for now but uh, yeah i i on the past i used to but <laughs> with clippy remember clippy yes i very much do <laughs> Our little friend that came out of nowhere to ask if you needed help. <laughs> yes, I never needed help, but yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I usually learn by messing with it. Figuring it out. Yeah. <laughs> How did you come to Clippy? I, I got lost. Yeah, but yeah, that's... My experiences in the metaverse. Yeah, that would be the, the evolution of it. Um, and one day we'll get to... By the player one. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> I I only know scenes from this movie for some reason. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it yet. Uh, mo most people think it's weird, but it it just didn't appear. Like I I turned my 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 television and I never remembered to search it. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely I, recommend it if you have time. Yeah, I I wrote it down <laughs> and I I will search it to see if they have it on mm -hmm. the streaming platform that I use that I won't advertise here <laughs> until they pay us yeah pay me <laughs> streaming platform <laughs> then I will say your name all you want yeah <laughs> oh. <laughs> but that's cool I'll, I'll check it out um yeah, I was talk uh, uh, I was interviewing uh, the the guys from Member Metaverse. Is another Metaverse building on here, and they were they, were, they also talked about Ready Player One and a book that has several layers of worlds. It was very interesting. So okay, uh, let's go to what are your plans for the future with your DAOs and Metaverse Wise and such. My plans, well, my plan has always, for this, has always been very simple, and it's been to offer as much of myself as I possibly can, as often as I possibly can. Um, like I said, I'm not special. Um, because I'm not special, I my mentality has always been to help or support or be there for the people who are special. And even down to the way I play video games and the way I play D&D, &D, like I've always been a, a druid or a shaman in WoW or a healer or a support caster type character in every game I've ever played. I've never liked to lead. I've never liked to be the person in the center, but I've always liked to offer whatever support I could to those in the center. So my plan 
is has always been pretty simple in here, and that's to find as many allies as I possibly can, help them succeed or get to wherever they want to go as fast as I possibly can. And then if I'm lucky, one day along the road, all those allies or one particular ally will notice what I can do and put me somewhere better than where I am. That's a good one. <laughs> but yeah, who defines you special? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, again, I know what special looks like. So when I see someone who, who possibly should be somewhere they want to go and i think that where their heart is in the right place or in the right direction then i just say is there anything i can do and if there is something i can do then i just try to do it to the best of my ability and if i'm really lucky it works and they end up somewhere better and hopefully i'll end up better for it yes and hopefully we'll we'll all one day grow and build better projects and bigger and in a healthy way because sometimes you have to be careful because web3 is so shiny and bright and we want to do everything at once and sometimes it's very uh exhausting because we think that because we like it we won't get tired but we will <laughs> Yes. So, so yeah, sometimes we have we want to do a bunch of stuff and be involved in, in thousand projects, but yeah, we have to also be careful not to overwork ourselves, even though we like to do it. Agreed. That's absolutely true. Yeah. I I've noticed that it's difficult to ignore my phone because I can work so easily from my phone. Yeah. My cat. <laughs> she she wanted to participate with her tail <laughs> yeah and then that's that's one of the things with the technology uh at the same time as it makes everything very easy uh we have to learn to put a a pause on it and, and that's hard when your computer is in your hand all the time because <laughs> it is is our it is where we, we play where we talk to people where we work is where we do everything so yeah sometimes we, if we this is the the part to be careful with uh to preservate also a little bit of our health mental health physical health because sometimes it's it can be a lot but not that will be bad you will feel good but long time in the long run it's hard so yes it can be you're absolutely right. We have to take it easy. <laughs> yes, we do. And now to uh, talking about the another one about the future. Uh, if you could give some words of advice, wisdom for those who are starting now, getting on this new community, what would you say to them? Don't wait six months. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> don't wait six months like I did thinking that there's nothing of value that you can offer. Um, you can offer yourself. If you if you can offer time and energy, then that's usually more than enough. Um, especially if you can speak English and you can write. If you can speak more than one language, you're already winning. Uh, I speak bad Spanish, so that's pretty good. That helps. <laughs> Uh, it also helps with the Portuguese because there's a lot of overlap and I'm learning Portuguese, so there's more overlap. Um, just t doubt and hesitation are probably going to get in your way more than you are. So don't let them if you can, even though it's not easy. Um, again, just don't wait for someone don't especially do not wait for someone to give you permission or to tell you to do something because that's not going to happen. Everyone, especially in the Web3 world, is too busy and too distracted and too involved in their own projects, of which they're probably involved in six of them at the same time, to tell you, hey, you should probably really check this out. More often than not, if you found something and you're into it, grab it, show it to someone and ask if they think you're a fit. And if they say yes, go for it. 
because they're probably right. That's it. That's about it. Yeah. Good advice. Uh, put your feet on the water <laughs> and start yeah. from there. And that's mm -hmm. a good one. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you, Woodward, for the for the interview. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. Thank you no, thank for you. your time and your presence. Oh, thank you. Right, well, we'll be thanking each other then. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be, oh, thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we should do this again. Sure. Thanks a lot for everything. It was uh, it was very good. And Pleasure with See mine. you next time. <laughs>